Later in the NES's lifespan, we saw some very impressive looking games. This is a big difference when you look at the earlier games on the console. Was the NES really capable of producing these later titles, or did the console receive some help? Let's take a look. What's going on? It's Poger coming at you with another video. Alright, so we're going to be talking about Enhancement Chips, also known as Mappers. I wanted to give a shout out to Ah It's John. Ah It's John. He's a great photographer, that's for sure. Better than me. And his dog is cute. I mean, what kind of dog is that? You guys have any idea? He's also got an Instagram, so definitely check that out. But he came up with the video idea and I really appreciate it, so here I am. He told me about it on Discord, so if you got a second, check out our Discord server. It's at discord.poger.net. I'll also put a link right in the description. And if you've seen my videos before and you like what I do, hit that subscribe button right there. It only takes a second, but it helps our community grow. Anyway, my brain's getting all confused with all these things that I had to say in the intro. <laughs> Maybe I should have a mapper in my brain. Increase my memory a little bit. You know what I mean? That was funny, come on. <laughs> Let's get started. The idea of cartridge-based video game consoles was revolutionary. Before that, there were Pong consoles which only contained one game. If you wanted a new game, you had to buy another Pong console. But with cartridge-based consoles like the Atari 2600, you could keep the same console for years and still buy brand new games for it. Even if the game came out years after the console's release, as long as it was compatible with the console, you could play it. But this came with a big disadvantage. Technology becomes obsolete quickly, so it doesn't take long for consoles to show their age. While newer arcade games show off new hardware every year, consoles still have the same hardware they did on release day. It's not like you can push out a system update. In the case of the Atari 2600, if a game comes out in 1981, it's stuck with the 1977 hardware. So while arcade games are getting more complex and advanced, console hardware will remain the same until the company releases a brand new one which will require new games. The Atari 2600 was only capable of handling 4 kilobytes of ROM space or less per game. With arcade ports being very popular on the 2600, companies were having a hard time porting over the latest and greatest using the 4 kilobyte limit. So they utilized a trick called bank switching. This is essentially when you take a game that's more than 4 kilobytes and break it into 4 kilobyte segments so that the console can read each one individually. This lets you double, triple, and even quadruple the amount of ROM space games can hold. This was an amazing breakthrough that allowed for bigger, more advanced titles that were previously never thought possible. For example, Secret Quest was an adventure game like Legend of Zelda and was massive for a 2600 game. Radar Lock is an ambitious flight simulator with a very impressive rotation effect. Atari and other companies were putting good use to the bank switching trick. One company, however, wanted to push things even further. With the success of their game Pitfall, Activision wanted to make a sequel that was better in every way. The first game didn't have any scrolling and didn't feature any music during gameplay. In fact, lots of Atari 2600 games didn't have music. The console was not known for its sound capabilities, but Activision had an idea. They created the display processor chip, which was a computer chip that went in the cartridge. They knew the hardware was outdated and there was no way to change that, so instead they shipped all cartridges with this chip inside. With the display processor chip installed, we can hear that the music is nothing like we've ever heard on the console. With the Atari 2600 having such a long lifespan and the competition around it getting better, companies had to start being creative with getting the most out of the console. These tactics like bank switching and Activision's enhancement chip were all things that helped extend the lifespan of the 2600. But it wasn't the only console by Atari to receive enhancement chips. The Atari 7800 was released in 1986 after the NES came out. The console had some great potential, but sadly, the console didn't have strong third-party support, 
and it had a weak lineup of games, most of which didn't utilize the console's fullest capabilities. It didn't help that the console reused the sound chip from the 2600. To make up for this, the Pokey sound chip was used in two games to expand the audio capabilities of the 7800. This chip was previously used in later models of the Atari 400 and 800 and was used in the Atari 5200, meaning that all games could use the expanded audio. For whatever reason, they didn't include it in the 7800. Talk about a missed opportunity. Atari wasn't the only company to use enhancement chips in their games. In 1983, when the Famicom was released, the first set of games were very primitive. Nintendo's console ports Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. had to cut content from their arcade counterparts. Donkey Kong specifically had to remove a level in order to meet the 32 kilobyte ROM space limit in the Famicom. Hudson Soft's first line of games on the Famicom were also single screen titles that were very basic compared to what we would get later. 32 kilobytes of ROM space was not a lot to work with, so companies began working on enhancement chips. Most people don't know this, but the NES was heavily reliant on enhancement chips, or mappers, to get the job done. In the US, one of the first mappers ever made was CN-ROM. This expanded the ROM space from 32 kilobytes to 96 kilobytes, which is a substantial increase. This 96 kilobytes was accessed through bank switching, similar to what Atari did. This mapper was used in games like Gradius, Ghostbusters, and Arkanoid. This is surprising because these titles were so simplistic. They needed a chip for these? Radius is a great game, but scaled down from the arcade version and very short. Arkanoid is another decent title, but very basic in nature. To be fair though, this is a longer game with 36 stages. So anyway, I'm surprised that the NES would need mappers for these games considering they're not exactly pushing the hardware limits at first glance. Then there was UN-ROM. This expanded the amount of ROM space further to 256 kilobytes, once again requiring bank switching to access this extra data. This was a huge increase because that gave developers a lot more wiggle room. It was used in games like Contra, Castlevania, and Mega Man. These are some great games, but surprisingly they required a mapper. Remember that these are fairly early releases. Could it be that the NES is not as powerful as we might have thought? The MMC-1 chip expanded the ROM space as well, and also enabled support for multi-directional scrolling. The NES was capable of scrolling vertically and horizontally, but struggled to do both at the same time. That's why earlier NES games usually stuck with one or the other. Games like Ninja Turtles, Metroid, and Mega Man 2 used the MMC-1 chip. Like before, these are some great games, and slightly more hardware pushing than the previous games we talked about, but still surprising they required extra assistance. Some mappers weren't as useful for most games, but instead only had one purpose. The MMC2 chip manipulated bank switching so that more graphics could be used on screen at a time. This mapper was used in Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, and regular Punch-Out of course. This is a very unorthodox game because there's only one sprite on the entire screen. Only your opponent is represented as a sprite. Not even Little Mac or Mario are sprites. It's very cool to see a sprite so large and well detailed. I've honestly never seen anything like this on the NES. Considering its purpose in Punch-Out, I can see why this mapper might not have been useful for many other games. Can you think of another game where there's only one big sprite at a time? One of the console's most well-known mappers was the MMC3 chip. This one allowed for split-screen scrolling while increasing the amount of ROM space. It was used in Super Mario Bros. 2 and 3, Kirby's Adventure, Mega Man 3, and others. The MMC3 chip expanded the capabilities of the NES a lot, allowing for easier multi-directional scrolling. Games like Super Mario Bros. 3, which was a very long game with massive stages, would have never happened without the existence of mappers. The MMC3 chip also allowed for a stationary status bar during multi-directional scrolling. In earlier games like Ninja Turtles, that game could scroll vertically and horizontally, but the status bar was constantly glitching. If the game used the MMC3 chip, maybe this issue would have been resolved. The games I mentioned earlier are at least more impressive titles that I could see using some kind of enhancement chip. It's the earlier titles like Gradius that surprised me. 
The last mapper we'll talk about is the MMC-5. This was a massive powerhouse. It was used in the NES version of Castlevania 3. The chip had similarities to the VRC-6 that was in the Japanese version of that game. However, the VRC-6 chip supports extra sound channels on the Famicom that weren't compatible with the North American NES. Still though, the MMC5 chip expanded the amount of ROM space to 2 megabytes. That's an insane amount of space, but no officially released NES game has ever gone over 1 megabyte. Still very interesting that there is potential for more though. These are a few of the chips in the US that were approved by Nintendo of America. The company didn't allow game developers to use chips that weren't approved by them, so when Japanese titles were localized in the US, the games had to be modified to support the approved chip, which usually meant taking away features. In Japan, Nintendo was more lenient and allowed game companies to manufacture their own enhancement chips, so they had more creative freedom with their games. So as we can see, even the most basic games required some help from outside sources. So what's the most you can do without any enhancement chips then? Surprisingly, Super Mario Bros. doesn't use any mappers. It's amazing how well this game turned out considering that. The levels are fairly large and there's 32 stages in the game total. This was a very complex game for its time and it's commonly considered to be the most the NES can do without any enhancement chips. While the NES had some very impressive looking games, a majority of them required assistance from enhancement chips. The console was actually more limited than what people might think, because most gamers don't know how reliant the console was on mappers. This is a big contrast to the Atari 7800, which did not need enhancement chips for their games except for the Pokey sound chip in two of them. Unfortunately for Atari though, the hardware limits were never pushed all that much on the 7800, so we wouldn't see the console's true potential. At least not until the homebrew community came in. Crystal Quest is a very nice platformer with lots of colors on screen and cool parallax scrolling. How does the NES compare to the Atari 7800? We saw some very impressive looking NES game, especially late in the console's lifespan, but they all required mappers in order to happen. The earlier games that did not use mappers, and even the ones that used CN-ROM, were much more basic. On the contrary, the Atari 7800 didn't require enhancement chips for their games to work except for Pokey and two of them. All of the games were running strictly on the console's hardware. Perhaps the NES is not quite the powerhouse that we thought it was. Hey, I just wanted to thank you so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, hit that like button. If you enjoy this type of content, hit the subscribe button for more content. Both of these things really help the channel grow. If you have anything to share, feel free to leave a comment. I read every single comment on this channel, and I'm pretty good at replying back. Anyway, have a good one.